A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. When I was growing up, my family ate dinner together almost every night. I loved it. There were eight people at the table, mom, dad, my three brothers, myself, and two grandparents. While we were eating, there was always a topic of conversation. Might be religion, might be politics, but a frequent topic was what were we going to be when we grew up and where were we going to go to college? My brothers would always say, well, I want to be a scientist or a doctor or a lawyer or an FBI agent. A lot of those things appealed to me, too, but I had the feeling those things weren't really open to me. For my generation, going to college for a woman was to get your MRS degree, meaning Mrs., a Mrs. to a Mr. Your job after graduation was to become a wife a housekeeper, and a mother, not a scientist or a CEO or especially an FBI agent because women were not even allowed to be agents back then. So when Betty Broderick was all over the news for killing her ex-husband and his new wife, her story of being stripped of the life she once had, a life she helped him build, and replaced by what a lot of people saw as just a younger version of her. Betty's whole identity, what she was tied to, was no longer a part of her. This struck a chord for many, many women. They identified with her rage. And not just women, some men did too. This still resonates even today. Betty's story was recently the focus of the second season of the television series Dirty John. She was a woman scorned, and then she became a murderer. From Wondery and Treefort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is Killer Psyche. I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. I've interviewed many murderers, including serial killers, and the question I get asked time and time again is, why did they do it? It is difficult to get a satisfying answer without doing a deep dive into the killer's mindset. So in this series, I will do just that and give you my best analysis of what made them do what they did. This episode is Betty Broderick. The Twelfth of Never is one of my favorite songs. I remember as a teenager going to dances, and that particular song was so beautiful. It almost encouraged you to fall in love. And although it has been covered by many artists like Elvis and Cher, the Johnny Mathis version is my favorite. The defining lyric is a classic. You ask how long I'll love you, I'll tell you true. Until the twelfth of never, I'll still be loving you. The phrase means a time in the future that will never happen. And the promise behind that song is that there will never be a time your love does not love you too. It's a poetic ideal that sounds wonderful, but People change, especially in their early 20s. More often than not, it's just not reality. On April 12, 1969, Dan and Betty Broderick were married in a lavish ceremony in Tuckahoe, New York. Their wedding song was the 12th of Never. Betty Broderick studied to be a teacher, but that was not what she wanted. What she wanted was to be a wife a homemaker, and a mother, above all else. And Dan Broderick made that come true for her. Betty became a full-time homemaker, and Dan 
was a very successful malpractice attorney. He earned over a million dollars a year, and they lived in affluent La Jolla. They had an active social life, and it seemed to those around them, the Brodericks were the perfect family. After 14 years of marriage and four children, Betty became suspicious that he was having an affair with his 22-year-old assistant. Her name was Linda Colcana. He denied the affair at first, but he soon left Betty and the kids, saying that he needed more space. For Dan and Betty, the promise of the 12th of never would not happen, and soon Dan filed for divorce. The Broderick's divorce was infamous, but not just locally. The whole nation knew about it. Betty Broderick became the poster girl for a woman scorned. When it was finally over, Dan moved his new wife into the home he and Betty raised their kids in. And that was the tipping point for Betty. The emotional toll of the divorce became overwhelming for Betty, and her behavior became more and more erratic. Betty frequently broke into Dan and Linda's home, her former home, and graffitied the walls and smashed holes in them. She even took a Boston cream pie from the kitchen that Linda had made, took it upstairs, and spread it all over their bed, as well as Dan's custom-made suits. When she found out that her ex had sold the home he owned with Betty, sold it without her permission, and then bought a mansion and moved into it with his new wife, Betty was so incensed, she drove her car into the front door of their new home. Dan later told the LA Times that as he pulled her out of the car, she reached under the seat for a large butcher knife. The police picked her up and took her to a psych hospital where she was admitted involuntarily for 72 hours. Had the police known about the butcher knife, she would have been involuntarily signed in for two weeks. So Dan's claim doesn't really add up. Nevertheless, Betty was put in a mental hospital for three days. Apparently, Betty didn't think about the consequences of driving her car into a home where her children were. That act alone could prove to anyone she was unstable. Of course she was going to lose custody of her four children. She felt she had nothing, nothing at all, anymore. In April of 1989, Dan and Linda got married. They hired security guards to be at their wedding in case Betty showed up. She had left a message on their answer machine that clearly said, I am going to kill you. You're making me mad. I am going to kill you. About six months later, Betty received a notice that Dan was threatening to take her back to court for criminal contempt and prevent her from seeing her sons. Yes, she had lost custody, but she was allowed visitation. For Betty, this was the last straw. It was only two days after Betty got that notice that she used her daughter's keys that she had stolen and let herself into Dan and Linda's house at five in the morning. She brought along her 38 caliber, as she said, to either make them listen to me or kill myself in front of them. She very quietly walked upstairs, went into their bedroom, and stood over them while they were sleeping. She says Linda woke up and screamed, call the police. She claimed that this startled her and the gun simply went off, went off five times. One bullet hit the wall and the other hit a nightstand, but the other three found their mark. Two of them hit Linda, one in the neck and one in her chest. She died almost instantly. The fifth bullet pierced Dan's back and ripped into his right lung as he was reaching for the phone. But Betty grabbed it before Dan could call anyone and ripped it out of the wall. Later at her trial, medical evidence presented said that Dan did not die right away, and had he been able to call for help, he might have lived. 
After Betty shot Linda and Dan, she fled from the house. She then called one of her daughters and told her what she had done. Her daughter encouraged Betty to turn herself in. And later that day, Betty surrendered to the police. In 1990, Betty Broderick's face was everywhere. Cable news, interview shows, newspapers. She was even on Oprah. She was the woman who had had enough. The woman who became a symbol for divorced women everywhere who empathized with her fury and pain. But Betty did not start out being an icon for divorced and jilted women. There was nothing in Betty's childhood that would predict the violence she exhibited later in life. She was raised in the leafy New York City suburb of Bronxville, the third of six children in a strict Roman Catholic household. Betty said that her whole life, she was trained to be a housewife, to support her husband and, quote, be blessed in your later years with beautiful grandchildren. But Betty did more than that. She went to college and earned a degree in early childhood education. Just before Betty turned 18, she went with a friend to South Bend, Indiana to watch a Notre Dame football game. At an after party, a young man introduced himself to her by handing her a napkin. He had written on it, Dan T. Broderick, MDA, medical doctor almost. Dan was studying medicine at Cornell University. Betty was charmed by him, and they dated while each of them finished their degrees. And soon after, they became engaged. The couple married in 1969, and their first child, a little girl, was born the next year, just before Dan completed his medical degree. But he was very ambitious. His goal was to become a malpractice attorney. So he needed to go on to law school. Life was moving very fast for the young couple. They had their second daughter in 1971 and moved their growing family from New York to Boston so Dan could go to Harvard Law School. Dan was in school full time. Betty, therefore, became the main provider, but she knew that eventually Dan would be successful and then she would be able to relax. Then, in February of 1973, Betty gave birth to their third child, a son. But tragically, he died soon after. Betty claims that Dan was actually angry at her for going into labor during the first ski trip he had been able to take in years. Her baby's death, coupled with her husband's callousness, drove Betty, who was only 23 years old, to attempt suicide for the first time. She said what happened left her feeling isolated, trapped by Dan, and cut off from her family. It's entirely possible that Betty was suffering from postpartum depression. Women can experience various degrees of postpartum depression, and while suicidal thoughts are a severe symptom, it's not one that is uncommon. Betty wrote in her memoir that she was so traumatized by the death of her son, she was terrified to go through that again. This is not uncommon at all. Betty went on to have two abortions after the stillbirth death. According to Betty, Dan did not believe in birth control. If this is indeed true, we will never know if that was due to his religious beliefs or his need for control over Betty. When Dan was hired right out of law school by a prestigious law firm in San Diego, the young family relocated to the West Coast. A few years later, Betty had two more children, both sons. At the same time their family was growing, Dan started his own law firm and he earned even more money. And that allowed them to live a very high-flying lifestyle. Now that they were flush, Betty was able to be the housewife and mother she had always hoped to be. In 
At an office Christmas party in 1982, Betty overheard Dan talking about a 21-year-old receptionist in his building, Linda Kolkina. He thought she was beautiful. This was the first time Betty had even heard about Linda. And when Dan ended up hiring her to be his assistant, Betty was furious. She kept asking Dan why he hired her. Dan had admitted that Linda was not a lawyer and did not bring any type of professional experience that could help his practice. On top of that, she didn't even type. So Betty gave her husband an ultimatum. Fire his beautiful young employee within 30 days or else. Clearly, Betty was scared. Dan refused to fire her and denied being involved with Linda in any way. For the next few years, Betty continued to suspect that he was cheating on her. She got reports from friends that they saw Dan here, there, and everywhere with Linda. When Betty confronted Dan, he would tell her that she was crazy and paranoid. At the same time, according to Betty, he would tell his wife that if he cheated on her, it was because she was, and I quote, old, fat, ugly, and boring. What was she to do or think? So am I crazy and paranoid? Or are you cheating because I'm old, fat, ugly, and boring? Dan was constantly feeding her two different narratives and then denying them both. Essentially, he was gaslighting her. The term gaslighting comes from a 1938 play, Gaslight. It was made into a very famous film in 1944 starring Ingrid Bergman. A woman's husband slowly tricks her into believing she is insane. He does this in order to hide his own criminal activities. Gaslighting is an extreme form of emotional manipulation, and it's aimed at controlling the way someone sees themselves and sees their reality. They do this through tactics such as denial, lying, and contradiction. This is exactly what Dan was doing. When someone is gaslighting you, you often second-guess yourself, your memories, and your perceptions. Kind of like, wait, that memory is clear to me. No, no, it's not clear to me. You start to doubt yourself. This is a form of psychological abuse, and the purpose is to destabilize a person from the outside in. Betty's defense team put forward this theory as one of the reasons that Betty snapped. When someone is gaslighted, they feel like they have no control. It's difficult for victims to break through the denials, lies, and manipulation, so they can feel like they must take extreme measures to regain the control they lost. Betty's mental health became even more precarious as their marriage deteriorated. She stopped taking care of herself, She struggled to keep up with simple day-to-day responsibilities. And it was during this time she gained more than 60 pounds. Once Dan left her for Linda, she became even more riddled with self-doubt. It did not help that Linda was almost a twin of Betty's younger self. In fact, when I first saw Linda's picture, I actually thought it was Betty, only with a different hairstyle. When I consider Betty's significant weight gain, combined with her lack of energy for herself, her home, her family responsibilities, it strikes me these are classic signs of clinical depression. Betty's friends, and she had lots of them, claim that before she became aware of Dan's cheating, she was outrageously funny and really outgoing. But as the marriage troubles escalated, they also noticed some drastic changes. She became withdrawn and much less social. Her house was often a mess, and she had trouble maintaining the super mom persona that she had crafted, even forgetting sometimes to take her kids to their activities. Betty's home and her kids were two things she used to take great pride in. In November of 1983, Betty attempted suicide again when Dan missed her 36th birthday. She wrote in her memoir that she was being driven crazy 
by his treatment of her and his lies. Two weeks later, she went to Dan's office on his 39th birthday. She brought flowers and champagne. When she got there, she found out Dan and Linda had gone to lunch hours before and had not returned. It was a crushing blow for Betty. Now she was convinced he was cheating and she lost control. She went home and burned all his clothing. He still denied everything, called her crazy, and he refused to move out. Let me tell you this about destroying someone's clothes. It's a very angry act. But anger slays the depression dragon every single time. Soon after that, Dan moved the entire family to a new rented home, claiming their old home needed a lot of repairs. But after six months, Dan claimed he needed more space and moved back to their old home without them. Betty desperately wanted the marriage to work out. She became what is known as an obsessional estranged lover. This makes up the largest category of pursuers and stalkers. According to psychologist Robbie Ludwig, they tend to consist of people who cannot let go of a romantic relationship. Their entire self-identity is dependent on the other person's love and need for them to be in their life. Without someone in love with them, they feel empty. Their self-worth is non-existent. And they only feel whole when they are merged with someone that loves them. And if that person can elevate their status in life, all the better. Their partner's professional status enhances their self-esteem. In this case, Dan was a very successful attorney and Betty's own sense of self was boosted by that. She was completely dependent on her husband and her emotional and psychological health, her very self-worth, all that was bound to him and him only. This type of stalker has only one motivation, reconciliation. They think they cannot exist without their partner and getting the object of their obsession back becomes their singular focus. They are not psychotic, a clinical term like erotically obsessed maniacs. And those are stalkers that imagine they actually have a connection to a stranger they are stalking. Real estranged lovers are actually more likely to be psychopathic, a personality disorder, not a mental illness. But Betty was not psychotic. She did not hear voices and she was not delusional. But Betty does have a personality disorder, what I call a chink in the DNA armor. Betty most likely suffers from one of the original six personality disorders, borderline personality disorder. This disorder, as defined by the National Institute of Mental Health, is very serious and it is characterized by frequent mood swings, self-image problems, and behavioral changes. For Betty Broderick, the stress she was under, thinking and knowing that Dan was cheating on her, and the emotional strain caused by Dan's gaslighting, all of these things intensified what she was feeling and it resulted in her destructive and impulsive acts. People with borderline personality disorder, and three out of four of them are female, frequently experience periods of anxiety, depression, and intense anger. Sometimes it lasts for a few hours and sometimes for days. In this state of mind, everyone around the person is the target of their personality and behavioral problems. They make everyone around them miserable, frightened, confused, and very insecure, especially their children. And if children are very young, they don't know what to expect next. They become very insecure in their own home. People with borderline personality disorder, also known as BPD, exhibit very unusual and intense attachments. That makes this diagnosis very common among stalkers. Their greatest fear is of abandonment, and Dan was abandoning Betty. As the Brodericks' divorce dragged on, Dan put more and more restrictions on Betty. 
Betty's control over her own life was so diminished by the battle and her tunnel vision on Dan intensified. She couldn't find a divorce attorney in San Diego to take her case. Dan was very powerful in the legal community in San Diego and no one wanted to cross him. So she chose to defend herself. And you know the saying, a person that chooses to represent themselves has a fool for a client. Betty did not focus on anything in the proceedings except that he had cheated on her. Unfortunately for her, California had become a no-fault divorce state, so that did not matter and Dan easily came out on top. She also still held out hope that Dan would come to his senses and come back to her. She thought that if he had to take care of the children, he would realize how badly he needed her. So she proceeded to drop them off at his place, one by one over a period of time, to live with him. It was a huge mistake on her part. Dan was able to argue that she was not capable of taking proper care of them and was willing to abandon them. And this gave him grounds to ask for full custody. When their divorce was finalized in January of 1989, Dan was granted full custody of all four children. And her financial settlement, although sizable, was not at all what she expected. Aggravating the situation even more was Dan's constant censuring of her. He fined her for every time she did or said something that he did not think was appropriate. And honestly, a lot of what she did was absolutely not appropriate. But the more intense and rabid her obsession became, the greater her need to lash out. Betty believed that everything Dan and Linda did was done to antagonize and torture her. Linda had refused to give Betty back her wedding china, and Betty was certain it was done to make her crazy. A longtime friend and neighbor of Betty's told the Los Angeles Times that once Dan took Linda and the children to Vail, Colorado for a ski trip. Meanwhile, back in San Diego, roses arrived at Betty's door. He sent her roses saying what a wonderful time they were having. Betty felt the flowers were meant to spite her. It was sort of like a hobby for him, tormenting her. He would say, why don't you kill me then? Just taunting her and I'm going to make you suffer. Dan, on the other hand, had to deal with Betty's continual profanity-filled phone messages and her inability to obey the restraining orders. That frightened Dan and Linda, and they would have her arrested for violating the orders several times. And here's an interesting thing. As much as Dan claimed that he wanted to get rid of Betty, his divorce arrangements kept her dependent on him. For example, instead of splitting up their belongings, he would store them away and give them to her one by one, making her beg for them. If he really wanted to be rid of her, he would have given her everything at once. But he didn't do that. All of that makes me think perhaps Dan was getting something out of stringing her along. Not that he wanted to be married to her, but he maybe really liked fighting with her. Maybe he was getting a guilty pleasure out of seeing her in pain. Maybe he was doing this because he needed Betty to need him. But... There could be other reasons, or there could be many reasons. He could have ended it quickly, but he kept it going. That tells me he was getting something out of it. Whatever it was, it was toxic. Dan and Betty's viewpoints were so polarized. One of their friends said in an LA Times interview that it was sometimes hard to recognize when they were describing the very same incident. But, you know, that's not surprising. Two people's perspectives on the same thing frequently differ. However, I did notice in all the tapes I watched of Betty, whenever she cried and complained of what Dan and Linda were doing to her, she always left out or minimized her role in the event. For example, when she drove her car into Dan and Linda's front door. When asked about that in an interview in 2016, she said, I just bumped it. 
I could have really destroyed it if I wanted to. And then she chuckled. I can tell you, having seen the pictures, it was more than a bump, and she could not possibly have known who was on the inside of the door. When Betty ran the car into that door, she was in a blind rage. When someone is in a blind rage, reasoning and logic do not matter. What I find interesting is after the fact, and 26 years later, Betty says, oh, I just bumped it. Like I said, Betty always minimized her role in any of her bad acts. She would also get furious with her children when they seemed to disagree with her anger. One of the Broderick daughters testified at the trial that her mother would direct her cruelty at the children and frequently told them she hated them. Linda told friends that Betty told her youngest son that if he loved her, he would stab Linda in the stomach. In an article in Psychology Today, Lisa Phillips wrote about how women who contend with rejection are haunted by the, quote, crazy psycho bitch title. She says, and I quote, the primal frustration they may feel gives them little real power to get love back or to get a satisfying explanation of what went wrong. She goes on to say that when a person realizes that a reward they were expecting or want, such as love, sex, or sometimes drugs, is not delivered, the brain's network for rage, which is closely connected to areas in the prefrontal cortex that assess and expect rewards, is triggered. It's triggered by not getting the reward they think they should get. Unfulfilled expectations can make us furious and aggressive. The destruction that Betty caused to Dan and Linda's home and the hundreds of angry voicemails that she attacked them with could only placate her rage so much. One behavior of Betty's that is talked about a lot in the media is her absolute lack of remorse for killing two people. She is 100% convinced that she did the right thing, that her actions were justified. Betty only wants to explain why she killed them. It's as if she thinks if she gives you the total rundown in details on the seven years between the time she suspected Dan was cheating to the moment she killed them both, then you will say, oh, I get it now. They actually deserved it. Good job, Betty. And I think I know the reason for Betty's inability to feel remorse. The reason that she has not been allowed out of prison is exactly that lack of remorse. Parole boards like to see that a person understands what they did was wrong and feels bad about it. And Betty can't even do that. She will not concede that what she did was wrong. But Betty was not just suffering from borderline personality disorder, she was also a narcissist, as was Dan. According to Davia Sills of Psychology Today, in the familiar model of narcissism, there are two types of it. One is grandiose, the other is vulnerable. They do have some things in common, but ultimately, they are different. They both share feelings and beliefs that they are entitled. They are both manipulative, and they both tend to be antagonistic rather than agreeable. Both Dan and Betty share these traits of narcissism, but that's where the similarity ends. When important things like power or control, self-esteem issues are on the line, it's narcissism that contributes to how we respond to those issues. In the face of a threat to security, such as Betty was facing, the vulnerable narcissist will tend to overreact, be highly defensive, and may have destructive reactions. But for the grandiose narcissist, under threat, they are cool, calm, and collected. You've heard me say it before. I call this C3. And those descriptions perfectly fit Dan and Betty Broderick, and that's why their divorce became the battle of the narcissist. Betty was never able to move past her relationship with Dan 
even though she was dating another man at the time of the murder. According to the LA Times, her teenage daughter once discovered her mom in the shower with another man. She asked her, how could she be mad that Dan had Linda when she had a boyfriend? And Betty replied, how can you equate the two? Brad doesn't support me. Her daughter said, quote, mom could never admit that she'd ever have a happy life and that dad did not ruin her life. Her daughter believed that hating Dan and Linda became Betty's reason for living. There's likely some truth to that. Betty still refers to Dan and Linda in the present tense. She used her anger and rage as a way to stay connected to Dan. And even now, in her conversations with the press, she still expresses resentment and bitterness towards them. But even more important than using her anger to stay connected to Dan, I think she used it to keep herself afloat, psychologically and biologically. Betty's anger kept the depression at bay. She once said the following to a court-ordered therapist, quote, I'm not going to see you anymore. You're good at this. Your job, very good. What you don't understand is that if I stop being angry, I won't make it. Even now, after almost three decades, she cannot see anything other than her side of the story. And a lot of it is a story she created after the fact. For example, her story of why she went over to Dan and Linda's house that fateful morning for, as she says, just a chat? Seriously, Betty? First, she went over at five in the morning. Then she quietly entered their house with keys she'd stolen many days before from her daughter. She brought a loaded gun that she'd been practicing with. Then she very quietly crept upstairs and went right into their bedroom. She pointed the gun at them. And then she says the gun just went off. But here's the deal, revolvers, can't just go off unless the trigger is pulled. And she pulled the trigger five times, emptying the cylinder. There's no doubt in my mind that Betty went there to kill them. I think she probably thought that it would end her emotional pain. Maybe if they were dead, she'd feel better. But of course, it didn't work. In Betty's first trial in 1990, she pleaded not guilty to two counts of murder. She claimed that she was driven over the edge by years of psychological, physical, and mental abuse at the hands of her ex-husband, and that she was a battered wife. Betty told the New York Times, and I quote, he took my home, my kids, my money. His was the white collar way of beating you. If he had hit me with a baseball bat, I could have shown people what he did and made him stop. The prosecution portrayed her as a woman who planned and schemed to murder her ex-husband. This trial resulted in a mistrial. The jury could not agree on whether Betty's actions were premeditated or not. In the second trial in 1991, the foreman said that the jury for this was also split until they listened again to a conversation between Betty and her then 11-year-old son, who can be heard crying throughout the recording. He begged her to stop causing trouble with her jealous and hateful words because he and his younger brother wanted to go back and live with her. They wanted their mom. Let's listen to some of that heartbreaking conversation right now. We don't want you no more. We want to live with you, but you're just making it harder for all of us. Fucking slugs. Throwing me in jail and stealing my house out from underneath. Oh, yeah. You know why he threw you in jail? Because you came and ran through his house. After he stole my house from me. 
You better stop saying bad words or else you're going to be more take off. <laughs> well, you know, no matter what bad words I say, I still don't have. That she could not even control her rage with her 11-year-old son begging and crying showed the jury how out of control and, dare I say, dangerous she was. She had no empathy for what her son might be going through or the damage she might be causing him by saying these things. When the jury re-listened to that taped conversation, it sealed her fate. The then 44-year-old Betty Broderick was convicted on two counts of second-degree murder and was sentenced to 32 years to life. Betty became an unlikely hero for women and some men who could relate to her rage over being dumped for the younger, prettier version of herself. And although most don't condone the murder, one of the jurors in her first trial said that they were, quote, surprised that the murder didn't happen sooner. Today, Betty is 73 years old and is incarcerated at the California Institute for Women in Chino, California. She is expected to spend the rest of her life behind bars. She has been denied parole twice over the years. In her memoir, Betty addressed her lack of remorse and the 2010 parole board denial by saying, quote, I don't think the parole board understood me at all because it wanted me to say there was no reason for what I did, but there was a reason. There were a thousand reasons, just no excuses. In January 2017, a two-member panel of California's parole board once again voted against releasing her from prison. In 2032, Betty will be eligible again for parole. She will be 84 years old. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. Next week on Killer Psyche, I'll be covering Ron DeFeo and the Amityville Horror Story. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Edited by Michael Schatz with Maxwell Carney. Our senior audio producer is Tom Monahan, And Haley Mandelberg is production coordinator. Brandon Clark and Lindsay Whistler are our production assistants, and the line producer is Oscar Guido. Our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort, and Marshall Louie and Erin O'Flaherty for Wondery. This series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. <laughs>